don't you know that God loves me more than you? <laughs> so no. In fact, I don't want anybody. Before we start, let's, let's, hey, good morning, everyone. Okay, God bless you. I'm glad to be here. I, <clears throat> yesterday I didn't know if I would have a voice, but it comes back usually. I had two surgeries on my vocal cords and I need a third one, but I'm good. Um, so to answer the questions, there were two questions. Are all the prayers answered when I pray? No. They are all answered, but not the way I pray. And so I want to clarify something. Uh, it's a long subject. I don't intend to preach that sermon. I, you can find it. I had serial, several series on prayer. If you go to lexingtonsdachurch.org, you can find them there and listen. It's like seven years worth of sermons. So you'll have there forever. And forever, it's a long time. But um, in my prayer series, I specify something that also I found in my study today in the morning early. I want to be very clear, take every word, to every honest prayer that is lifted in humbleness and from the open heart, an answer will come. That's a quotation. And I want you to hear how many of them? To everyone. Now she continues, it would be wrong to assume that God will answer the way we want in the time we want, but an answer will come when God considers the best, and he will answer better than we ask in a way that he has in mind our salvation and other things. So every prayer gets an answer, but not always the way we want. Now I want you to give you some input. Daniel, between first vision and second vision, I don't know if you know, but there were 38 years in between. You think that, oh, he had a vision today, he had a vision tomorrow, and a vision tomorrow night. Uh-uh. There was quietness. God doesn't talk every day. God doesn't talk as we talk for the like of talking. We just like to talk. Taka, 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 taka. And sometimes we say nothing like politicians. <laughs> God talks when there is a need. You follow me? And so, so many times I prayed and I didn't sense God answering. I'm going to give you an example. And the second question was, what is he? He went to get ice cream. I'm trying to remember the second question. Oh, he will tell me the second question when he comes. So, for instance, I'm going to give you a long example about how God doesn't answer prayers. And yet he answers prayers, but you don't know except a few years later. So, my wife and I were in Romania. We wanted to do something, have a business, do something. And... Uh, we looked into business and we started a photo lab. Now, a photo lab was wonderful in that time, all time, so you will not go to Walmart and basically it was not when you take a photo with your cell phone, you take a photo with your camera and it was not when you take a photo with your cam camera and have them in the memory and download them in the computer. You would go to Walmart and they would develop them. Do you remember what that means, develop? The film, there was a film. Tank, tank, that, that way of camera. Okay, and you develop the film and you'll discover that half of them are bad because you didn't put the good lenses and the good light and it was too much light and too little light and you didn't focus properly. Do you? Any of you knows those cameras? I used to have those cameras. I had the Zenith 5. You don't know what that means. It's a Russian camera, but absolutely good. I used to have a Minolta. Anybody knows Minolta? I used to have a Minolta. I used to have good cameras. And I would put the lenses and put the opening. And I used to do tricks because if you open lenses, you have clarity in this plan, but blurry behind and blurry in the front. And if I wanted to get your face and your hair and picky, picky, picky details, everything, I would open the lenses, but then you'd have to turn up the speed because it's too much opening and then too much light comes and burns the picture and it comes all black. So I would increase the speed, open the lenses and get absolute clear face, spotless, and the flowers behind were just blurry colors, beautiful like a card. But if I wanted depth to get everything clear, 
then I would close lenses and decrease, lower the speed. And everything was clear, but there was no purity in the picture. And I did all these tricks, and then my wife and I would get in the lab, and we would develop and see the picture coming, and then we would move from this tray to this tray, and then we would do all this crazy stuff, and we would work with the filter. 40 red, 55 blue, we would, uh-uh, the face is too red, change the filter. And we did that tricks, and we did photo by hand. Anyway, in that time, we had a business, we made money, we made like a, an average of five to 8,000 a Sunday, every Sunday, because they called us to do pictures for weddings, for, but people at weddings got drunk, and they wanted many pictures, and when they woke up, they said, I don't want so many pictures, and that bothered me. <laughs> so I gave up my photo lab. <laughs> Because, yeah, they were drunk, they wanted pictures. They were awake and then they didn't want to pay for it. So I gave up my photo lab. We started a sewing business. We had nothing. My wife knows how to sew. I have no clue. Don't ask me. I don't even know how to fix. If I lose this button, I don't know how to put it back. I don't care. But, so, but I had a smell for business. God gave me a smell. I can sense business and money, you know? And... <laughs> And so, it was in Romania. In that time, you would have to give people bribes. We call them gifts. <laughs> and so, if you go to the doctor and you are sick and you go empty-handed, he kicks you out. But if you open the door with your head, that means that your hands are full, then he wants to see you. So, you have in this hand uh, cheese and eggs and a chicken, and you have in this, eggs, in, in this hand uh, meat, and uh, so basically a bunch of gifts if you didn't have money. Either you give him 5,000 gifts or you give him a lot of gifts. And then the doctor says, come in, and he takes care of you. It was bribes. Anyway, and so the police would stop you for no reason. You're not speeding. And you'd give him something, a chocolate or something, and you would go. If not, he would give you a fine for nothing. So it was bribes. Anyway, so I purchased a lot of bribes. Literally a lot. I spent like thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands in bribes. I went to Bucharest and went to the first factory, 14 factories, that would sell raw cloth. It was like rolls of cloth, okay? And I went to the first factory. It was a crisis in Romania. You would go in the store and there was nothing, empty, nothing, literally nothing. It would be the seller and the empty shelves. It's like the seller would sell nothing. Literally, if you would go to the grocery store, there was nothing and the seller. And you would go there and people would wait in a line like two, three days and two, three nights because something is coming three days in the future. And you say, what is coming? We don't know, but you don't want to miss it. And then three days later, you would sleep there and your grandpa and you would go home and sleep. And then when the grandpa comes home, you would go there and stay in the line. And for, after three days and three nights, they brought eggs. And everybody would get a carton of eggs. And then you stay in the line and you get milk and then you stay in two, three days line and you get bread and it was crazy. But anyway, anybody remember those times? Yeah, yeah you know. And so, we, we, I got bribes. I go to Bucharest, I go to the first factory, knock in the door and say, I want to start a business in, in sewing and I need raw material. They shook their head. They had their people, their connections, their friends that they gave material to, not me. I was a new guy and I could not get into the you follow me? They would not accept me because they didn't trust me. And they said, we don't have materials, get out. Okay, it was winter. I went to the second factory and I didn't have a car, so I walked. We don't have materials, get out. I went to the third factory, now get out. I went to the fourth one. I gave everybody a gift until I finished my gifts. 14 factories, all kicked me out. Oh, I got so angry. When I go to the last one, to the 14 one, it was like, Two months later, it took me day by day. Bucharest is big, it's, I don't know, two million people, I don't know, how many? Two, two point two, two point, I don't know. Anyway, almost two months later, my shoes are broken, my feet are wet, I am frozen, end of the winter, and I have nothing. So I go to the 14 factory, I knock in the door, and I say, I'm not gonna talk to small people because small people don't respect me. I'm gonna go to the director of the factory, to the biggest one. I go to the biggest it's a lady. And instead of talking polite, I talk with a southern accent. We call it Olteni. Now, that southern accent talks wrong grammar. Instead of, I was there and I did that, they say some words like Fusei, but I don't know. It's some words in Romanian that are funny. And I started to talk in southern accent. I did that and I did that and, I, and nobody wants to give me material. 
don't send me from Anna to Kayafa. You send me from this manager to that manager to, and after two days of coming to your factory, you say no. Just say no. And the lady looks to me and the lady says, you are from south of the country, aren't you? It doesn't matter. Do you give me material or not? And she says, are you from what city? I said, Severin. She says, I am from Severin. What is your name? Goya. She says, my name is Goya. Who is your father? Pavel. Oh, he is my cousin. Who is your grandpa? John. Oh, he is the brother of my grandpa. We are relatives. Come in. I am the director of the factory. Come in. <laughs> okay. I go in. Sit down. What do you want? I just told you I want raw material. She says, where did you go? To all 14 factories in Bucharest. And they didn't serve you. No. Sit down. She takes the telephone. She was the girlfriend of the prime minister of the country. They were together. They were together. And she calls him and she says, hey, you don't see me tonight or tomorrow or next day or next day if you don't help my nephew. <laughs> he says, send him with your car. She gives me her driver, sends me to the, to the government. We called it Central Committee in the communist country. I get there, they open the gates. There are guards, police. I go inside the Central Committee the communist government. And I go to the prime minister. He invites me in. He says, do you, do you want a coffee? No. Do you want to smoke? No. Do you want to eat? No. What do you want? I said, didn't she tell you? <laughs> and he says, well, you want cloth to start a factory? Yes. Where did you go? All 14 factories. Sit down. He takes the telephone and calls the first factory. I'm going to fire you. I'm going to put you in jail. I ruin your life, your family. You give him the best you have. Bye. Second factory, third, all 14, he called all 14. And then he says to his driver, take the biggest 18-wheeler from the government garage. The biggest 18-wheeler. Take him with you, go to all 14 factories, make sure that he gets the best. I go back now to the first factory. First time when I went there two months ago, they get out. Now they come to me and they kind of bend. Mr. Goya, it's good to see you. <laughs> Please come in. And they say, this is for Romania, but we have good material for Holland, for Germany. Choose what you want, the best. I get the best, go to the second factory, go. I collected the best they had from 14 factories. I filled the 18 wheeler, 55,000 meters square, square meters on double cloth. Rolls and rolls and rolls. The whole 18 wheeler was packed. He drove the truck to our house in the west of the country, in Karansebe. You don't know the city. And then we got all the machines, we purchased all the stuff, we started to, to do the, you know, the product like t-shirts and pants and swimming suits and towels and bed sets and everything. We started to sell and we started to make money quite a lot. We uh, got to the point that we could buy a new car every day. We would make 40, 50, 60, 70,000 a day. And then uh, more and then more and then more and then we got a contract with Germany, another 2.5 million Deutsche Mark a month and it was a lot of money, a lot, a lot, a lot. And in that time, a lot, yes, <laughs> don't open big eyes, a lot. <laughs> in that time, I was friends with the prime minister and the chief of police and the chief of, and the mayor of the city and everybody, connections and school and education and power and influence and money and uh, when people get a lot of money, their head has a tendency to become a little bigger than normal. I don't know if you know what I mean. I thought I was kind. I thought I helped. I thought I was humble. But I was stubborn, worse than a donkey. I was angry. I was stressed. I was fast. And I was short-fused. Basically, I would lose my temper in a fraction of a second for anything. And people were slow, and I was fast, and I could not stop saying, I hate stupid people. I would say that they are so slow, they never think. I tell them, and they don't get it. That's the reason they are poor, they are stupid. And I would go on and on and on and on. Anyway, in that time, my wife and I started to think about the fact that when I was four years old, God called me to ministry. Now, I'm not going to tell that story because it's very long. Just read my book, One Miracle After Another. Google it, and you will see the story. And so 
We remember that God called me to be a pastor to serve him when I was four. It was a clear call, literally clear call, literally, literally clear. God said, I want you to be a pastor. And so when I was four, I prayed. I said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And my father said, pray. So I prayed, and I said, he doesn't talk. And I, my father said, he talks through the word. I said, give me the Bible. My father said, you don't know how to read. Just give me the Bible. I took the Bible. I said, Lord, I am just a child. Do you have a plan for me? I'm not sure you have a plan because you don't have plans for children, four-year-old children. So I opened the Bible, put my finger, and said to my dad, read here. And he read, and the Bible says there in Jeremiah 1, verse 5, don't say I am a child because I have a plan for you. You will speak for me, and I will put my words in your mouth. I said, okay, I'll be a pastor, close the Bible, and left. <laughs> anyway, so my wife and I, when we had the business and money, said, hey, God called you to, be, to serve. Not to serve self, but to serve him. So we started to build churches, we started to give, to help, to whatever, to do evangelism, to do Bible studies, to uh, help children in schools, we started to invest. In that time, the conference called me and said, we want to call you to be a pastor. And we cannot give you so many millions a month. We'll give you $64 a month. That's the pastor's salary. That was a joke. That was a bad joke. $64 a month. <laughs> so now let me go to the subject. I accepted. My wife and I talked. We gave the factory away to somebody who lost it in three months because he didn't know how to run it. <laughs> Literally. I mean, you need a gift for it. it. Not everybody can do that. And so... I went into ministry. Sure, I could not live with $64 a month. And I had time when I was arguing with the conference. Long story short, I'm not going to go there. And uh, basically, I could not live on his long story. I could not agree with everything. I could not do everything they said. And uh, It was during communism. And during communism, the communist government would force you to do some things that I didn't agree. And they said, if you don't do it, you go to prison. I said, I don't care. Put me in prison. For instance, it, it was against the law to bring Bibles in the country. I would go, get from Yugoslavia Bibles, hide them under the car, bring them in the country, give them to people. And uh, there are many stories behind. But, and then I went to former Yugoslavia, and uh, I would sell gas during the embargo, during the war in Yugoslavia, and in one day I made two, three, four salaries, and I still had a good life. But anyway, so let's go to the subject. What happened? I was a pastor, but I was not trained. And people would come to me, ask questions, and I was a good politician. Because I would play around, and they never knew that I didn't answer their question, but, and they thought I answered, but I never answered. Like politicians, you talk a lot, but you talk around. Like when they don't like the subject, they never give an answer. Have you noticed politicians, how they do it? I was really good. People would ask me questions, and I would feel them feel miserable that they ask questions, and I would tell them everything except what they asked. And then I said, you know what? That's not the way to, give, to be a pastor. Because a pastor, unless he tells the words of the Lord, he's a false prophet. And he, Ezekiel says that cursed be the prophets who go before my people and say, this is what the Lord says, when I didn't tell them anything. They say, this is what the Lord says, and the Lord says, when I did not give them any words, they present their words as my words, and they are cursed. And I said, I cannot go before people to tell them God's words when God didn't give me any words. So I need to receive God's words, and I need training. So we started to pray, and our life of prayer started. We prayed that God would send me to school to get educated so I know how to answer people's questions, to learn Greek, to learn Hebrew, to do translation from the Bible, to learn Adventist history, to learn church history, to learn all this crazy stuff. We prayed and put our car for sale. We had a Nissan Datsun. Anybody knows Nissan Datsun? In that time, it was a very good car. We had a Nissan Datsun, really good car. Perfect, perfect shape. I used to go to Germany, take a car after an accident, fix it myself, use it two years, sell it 10 times the price. That Nissan, I bought it for 100 Deutsche Mark, used it two years, sold it for 5,000. But anyway, yeah, I would make money. I used to make money. Anyway, so I had a Nissan. I put it for sale to go to school, and I applied to all schools in Europe. I don't know if you know Newbold in England, Cologne, uh, Maria and Hue in Germany, 
uh, in Austria, what is the Bogenhofen? Do you know all these schools? I applied to all the seminaries in Europe. Guess how many answers I got back? Zero. Nobody liked me. I had a big mouth. I was not polite. I was not respectful. And so nobody answered back. Even in my letters, hey, do you want me in school or not? Give me a straight answer. Don't play around with me because I don't like politics. That was my letter. <laughs> <laughs> nobody answered. And so we prayed and we fasted, my wife, not me. And we prayed and we prayed. Did it ever happen to you that you pray and get no answer? We prayed for school for one month, two months, three months, four months, six months we prayed. I put my car for sale to have money to go to school. Nobody called. I put my car in the newspaper. Nobody called. I put my car on the internet. Nobody called. I went to the market, put a big for sale, and I dropped the price. Nobody came. It was, come on, my car is better than the other. It's an expensive car. It's not Romanian junk Dacia. It's Nissan. Come on. Nobody came. In fact, a guy came to buy the car. When he came, he said, start the engine. My car always started. I go, it doesn't start. The guy left, and then the car started. He came back, I, I tried to start the car, he doesn't start. He left, the car started. I got angry, I started to hit the wheel of the car. My wife says, calm down, you are a pastor now, calm down. People see you, they think that you lost your mind. I was angry with the car. The guy came back, the car will not start. The guy left, the car started. My wife says, did it occur to you that God may not want you to sell the car? I want to sell the car! But what if God doesn't? I said, okay, I don't sell the car. I don't go to school, let's go home. And she said, you really need to learn patience to be a pastor. <laughs> we went home and gave up school. I got angry. I got angry, frustrated with God. I don't go to school. I don't care. Gave up school. Didn't pray for school anymore. But God is patient. He shakes his head and he says, you are still stupid. Anyway, <laughs> so I went home, gave up selling the car, gave up going to school, just did ministry. And listen what happened. Several months down the road, when I didn't even think or pray for school. A guy knocks in my door. He's from Timișoara, from Karansevich to Timișoara. Two cities different. It's 120 kilometers. It's far. He knocks in my door. He says, do you still have the Nissan for sale? I said, are you crazy? It was for sale like eight months ago. How do you know about the car? Well, my wife was starting the fire in the fireplace using old newspapers and she saw the car and she liked the color. That's what women do, they like the color. You ask them what brand it is, they don't know, but they know the color. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> yeah, they know nothing about engine or brand or quality, color. But anyway, <laughs> no offense, okay? But so, so she says, my wife liked the color. I said, but th that ad in the paper is eight months old. But do you have the car? Yes, I do, but it's not for sale. How much do you want? I asked 4,500. I give you the money, cash. Give me the car. No, I don't sell the car. Go away. <laughs> he left. I don't know his name. I don't know his address. I don't know his telephone. I don't know his email. Nothing. I don't know who he is. In a city of 1.5 million people in Timișoara, how can you find him? He lives that day at 2 p.m., in the mail comes a letter from Southern Adventist University. That night, I get a phone call from a friend. Hey, Pavel? Yeah, I'm Lauren. I said, I don't know any Lauren, bye. Brrr. Yeah, hey, Pavel, I'm Lauren. Hey, I don't know you. You do know me? No, I don't. I'm Lauren. I don't know any Lauren. I'm Laurentiu. Ah, Laurentiu, say so, man. He said, well, you remember we were together in the choir like 13, 14 years ago? Yes, I do. Well, I went to America. I married your cousin. I said, I'm sorry for you. I will pray for you. <laughs> 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 well, I don't want to talk about my cousin, but I said, I will pray for you. I'm really sorry. It's like the, the joke. At the zoo, the, the zoo keeper comes to the man and says, your wife got into the lion's cage. And the guy says, I'm so sorry for that lion. <laughs> and so, so he says, I married your cousin. I said, I'm sorry for you. I'll pray for you. He says, no, 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 hold on a second. We have been impressed by God every day and every night this week that you should come to the seminary to school here. I said, how do you know that I want to go to the seminary? And he says, do you? I didn't know that. God put it in our heart. I said, yeah, 
we prayed and we gave it up because God didn't answer. He says, where did you want to go to school? In Europe. What if God wants you to go to America? I said, nah, I don't like America. <laughs> yes, I said that. Why not? Because on the TV I see that people take drugs, they shoot each other in the streets. I don't want that. <laughs> he says, that's in movies. It's not real. It may happen one time in Chicago, one time in LA. But if you leave countryside, you can leave the door open. I said, you kidding me? And then I said, it's too far, too expensive. It's impossible to get a visa in our country. Nah. He says, pray about it. I said, yeah, okay. So, he talks to me, and then the mail comes. A letter from Southern Adventist University. Now listen carefully. When I was small, I asked God, when he gave up business, a few years before I became a pastor, when I was young, I asked God, do you really want me to be a pastor? And in that morning, the devotional came, Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the plans I have for you. And my wife and I said, maybe God has a plan for you to be a pastor. Let's, let's give up business and go to ministry. We gave up business, went to ministry. In the day when the letter came from Southern, the devotional in the morning was Jeremiah 29, 11. And in the letter from Southern, at the end of the letter that says you are accepted in our seminary, it was a Bible promise. Guess which one? Now, they didn't know what I studied, the devotional Jeremiah 29, 11. How did it happen that it came twice in the same day? God has a funny way to get your attention. Do you follow me? So in the letter from Southern was Jeremiah 29, 11. And my wife says, can it be that God sent the men yesterday to buy the car so we have money for the trip to America? I said, well, it could be, but he left and we don't know him. Let's pray. We said, Lord, if you sent that man to buy the car, send him again. We finish prayer, somebody knocks in the door. The guy says, my wife sent me back. You wanted 4,500, and then I gave you 4,500. You didn't sell the car. I am offering you 5,000. Just give me the car. I said, okay, take it. <laughs> <laughs> Sold the car. Borrowed the car from my head elder, a junk. Got in the car, a Dacia. A Dacia is a car that has two qualities. Goes slow and brakes fast. Anyway, <laughs> but anyway, and so I got in the car from my head elder, drove the whole night to Bucharest. We got there at 3 a.m. at the American Embassy. There were 967 people, 966, I was 67, I was 967, the order, because they have you pull a number when you stay in the line. 966 people ahead of me, I was 967. By 9 a.m. when they opened the American Embassy, the line went around the block, around the block, around the block, around the block, back to the Embassy gate, over 3,000 people in the line. That day, five people got visa, my family four and another one. To enter the Embassy, the fee to enter was $120, and the average salary was $60 a month. So it was two months' salary just to enter. And all of them got negative, so they lost the money. Do you follow me? Do, do you hear? Two months' salary to enter the American gate, the embassy. And then you enter, and it was like six windows. And people would go, and they would say, no, next. Oh, please, let me go. Next. No, next. Negative stamp. No, next. Next. Everyone, 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 everyone. Now my wife said to me, she was outside waiting for me. She said, honey, we gave up a powerful business to go to a poor life and be a pastor. But we did pay off our house, our car. We have no debt. We have friends. We have power. We have influence. We have a good life. We don't know English. Please, we, I really don't want to move to America and not know English and be in a country that we know nobody. I said, no worries. I'll take care of it. We don't go to America. Like Jonah. It's my turn to go to the window. And the American uh, consul or whatever says, where do you go? And I said, duh, what's wrong with you? This is American embassy, sure to America. <laughs> he says, why do you go? School, education, to be a good pastor. Why don't you go to school here? Because our school is not qualified, it's not good. He says, how do I know that you come back? You don't know. Do you promise that you come back? No. Then I don't give you visa. Thank you. And I left. 
He says, what? Everybody begs for visa. Why don't you beg? I said, well, I don't want visa. My wife doesn't want visa. I just came here because I don't want to fight God. Bye. <laughs> he says, you are crazy. I said, I know. Everybody tells me. <laughs> he says, come back. Why? Tell me again. Where do you go? I said, I told you once. I'm not going to tell you again. <laughs> he says, where do you go? I said, the American Embassy, America. He says, why do you go? School. How do I know you come back? You don't know. Do you promise? No. Why? What if God wants me to stay? I cannot give you visa if you don't promise. I said, good, because I don't want visa. <laughs> but you paid 120 to enter. I don't care money. He says, okay. How do I know that you don't care money? People go there to make money. I said, hey, I had a business. I could bury you in money. I gave it up to be a pastor. I don't need your money. He says, how do you prove that you had a business? I don't need to prove it. I don't need you to believe me. I don't care you. <laughs> he says, Promise me that you come back. I said, nope. I cannot give you visa. Bye. Come back. Let's talk. I don't want to talk. <laughs> he says, listen. You go there to go to school to be a good pastor. You had money. You gave it up to be a good pastor. And you cannot promise that you come back. And you don't want visa, but you are here. I don't get it. I said, well, God sent me here. I don't want to fight God, but I really don't want to move. He says, ah. Oh. I think I'm going to give you a visa. <laughs> I said, oh, come on. <laughs> I said, I don't want visa. Well, I give it to you, but not your family to make sure that you come back. I said, good. I'm not going to accept to go alone. <laughs> he says, please come, go alone and go to school and be a good pastor. I said, no. Would you go without your children? No. I don't go either. Bye. Okay, come back. I'm going to give it to the whole family. You promise that you come back? No. <laughs> okay, have a visa for the whole family. Oh, come on. <laughs> He gave us visa. We purchased the plane tickets for everybody, spent all the money, had $140 left over. That's it. Our neighbors, friends, relatives came, and they literally took everything. Everything. They came, we don't have TV. You have a color TV. Can we have your TV? Take it. We don't have a bedroom. Can we take it? We don't have a refrigerator. Take it. We don't have a washer or dryer. Take it. Everything, including clothing, including a carpet. It was just an empty house. They took everything. They said, you go to America. We are poor. I said, take it. We gave everything. We came like this. No baggage, no money. $140. That's the way we came. And my friend Lauren says, I have a business. I will pay school for you and rent. Great. He came, picked us up from the airport, took us to Southern, paid school for a month, paid rent for a month. He left to a business in Baltimore, and in front of the hotel, he had a heart attack. He died, he fell down and died. They came with the ambulance, they revived him with electric shocks, but he was dead for eight minutes. So he lost his memory. He was unable to walk, to talk, to sign. He didn't know his wife, he didn't know me. He had to start like a baby to learn everything from the beginning. It took him more than two years to recover. He lost his business, he lost his house, he lost his boat, he lost everything. So I am in a new country. I gave up a big business to be a pastor, gave up being a pastor in my house to go to America because God sent me to America. I didn't want America. I get to America, my friend loses everything. So I am in a new country without money, without English. All I knew was yes, no, buy. That's it, all the English. In a new country and I know nobody. And I eat every three hours and I have no food. What would you do if you were me? Everybody drives cars to school. I walk to the school and walk back. I start going to classes and the teachers speak like Japanese because people in Southern America, they, when they speak, it's like they bark. It's like, wah, 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 you know? And they swallow half of the words. So I understand nothing. And I hated school. And I hated education. And I hated, I have to say, I got angry with God. And I got so stressed because I used to have money, I used to give, but never take a penny. I was too proud. And I got so much stress that I got allergies from head to toes, spots on me, each full, burning, like Job. And I was scratching, and I was in pain, and I could not sleep in the night. And I started to cry. I said, take my life. I don't want to live. I don't want to serve. I don't want you. I don't want life. I don't care. Just take my life. I was angry with God. And I prayed. I said, Lord, please. I didn't ask for America. You send me here. Please answer my prayer. Nothing. 
Why would God allow me to go through that? And two small babies, we came, one was in first grade, one was in fourth grade. Why would God allow that? Why would God do that to your life? Take your business, take your job, take your house, bring you in a foreign country, drop you there, and leave you to die. Why? And I, I started to fight God, and I started to argue, and I would not even pray, and I would walk in the night, and I would argue, why would you do that? I never asked you for America. And anyway, no answer. I would go to school, I would go home, open a laptop, and try to, what is A, what is B? Ding, ding. It would take me four hours to type a page. First time when I had a laptop in my life. Anyway, I would go to school, go home, try to learn, and take the first word, go to the dictionary, find the word. Take the second word. It took me four hours to read one page. I learned literally on my knees by the bed. Lord, help me learn this language. In three months, actually, I took the TOEFL test, passed with highest possible grade. I was dreaming in English, speaking in English, praying in English in three months. But the first three months, I was going crazy. I went to the doctors, and the doctor said, there is nothing we can give you. All these things, it's allergy based on stress. We cannot help you, it's stress. One night, I was in bed. I could not sleep, I was itching all over my body. And I said, Lord, take my life or heal me. And it occurred to me that I am stubborn, that I am proud, that I make life difficult for everybody around me because I don't give up. And God wants to humble me and break me in order to use me. And I will never understand people in pain, and I will never understand people that are poor, and I will never be able to help anybody because I have not been there, and I have no feelings for them. And God needs to bring me there so I can help people. And that I have to give up my life and my health and say, do whatever you want, kill me. I surrender. So that night I said, Lord, I fully surrender. I don't care if you break me. I don't care if I don't eat. By the way, it was five days and five nights of no food. Never in my life I fasted more than three hours. It was five days and five nights without food. I was dizzy. I was unable to walk. We slept on the floor. We had no furniture. It was close to Christmas. We got a letter from the school. They will evict us from apartment because you didn't pay. We got a letter. We, they will expel me from school because I didn't pay. We got a letter. They will cut electricity because I didn't pay. It was all coming together bad. And so, now listen carefully. That night, I said, Lord, I have no money. I have no food. I didn't pay apartment. I didn't pay school. I have no work. I don't know English. I'm just broke. So I started to cry. And I said, I give up. Do what you want. I don't care. If I die, if I just don't care anymore. Do what you want. I surrender. That night, it was the first night when I slept after several months. And I remember that morning, I walked to school. And by the school, it was a garden of prayer and the trunk of a cut tree and background music. And I got by the tree. And I put my head on the tree and I started to cry and I broke. And I said, Lord, I don't care school, I don't care America, I don't care anything. I don't, you want me Africa, I go to Africa. You want me Yugoslavia, I go to you. You want me Africa, I go to America. I don't care. From now on, you decide. In that moment, somebody came and hit me on the back. Young man, and bang on my back. It was Dr. Blanco, the dean of the seminary. Young, you know the clear word, the Blanco Bible? Yeah, he, he's the guy. Young man, why are you crying? As a proud guy, I cleaned my eyes, I got straight, I said, I never cry. <laughs> <laughs> he said, you are crying, but you are proud. I said, no, I don't cry. He says, yes, you are, you are crying. Why do you cry? I said, you are not Catholic, please, so I'm not going to tell you my problems. <laughs> he says, you are struggling, aren't you? I said, well, yeah, that's my problem. He started to ask around, and he learned that I didn't pay school or rent. That Sabbath, now listen carefully, I go to church. Pastor Ed Wright, who is the Georgia Cumberland president right now, he was the pastor of College Dale Church. He started the sermon. Guess what was the scripture reading? Jeremiah 29, 11. It was three months later, I knew English, some English, and he started to preach. And he said, I know the plans I have for you. God has a plan, 
but God cannot fulfill that plan before he will break you. Because as long as you rely on your wisdom and power, God will never be able to use you and you will accomplish nothing. And only when you learn to surrender, God can do amazing things through you and make you a blessing. He was talking to a 4,000 members church, but I felt like he was talking to me. And then he said, when God called Moses, Moses was somebody like Pharaoh's son, had a great future. God put him in the wilderness. He lost everything. And then God called him. And Moses said, but I have nothing except a stick and I don't even know how to speak. And God said, if I call you, I will provide. You don't need to worry. So my wife and I looked to each other. We took hands and we said, you know what? Let's stop worrying. If God called us, he will provide. Let's stop worrying. I got outside from the church. I shook the hand of the pastor. I said, thank you for the sermon. Bye. I go home. Thursday night, somebody knocks in the door. I open the door. The pastor, Ed Wright. I said, come in. Why did you come? Well, you said, thank you for the sermon. I was wondering why. So I went to the school. I found out who you are. And Dr. Blanco told me that he found you crying in the garden. You remember? And he dug a little around and he learned that you didn't pay tuition or rent and you are ready to be expelled. And he says, what do you want? I said, nothing. He says, this is the deal. I'm going to talk to my church and we will pay tuition for you for one year if you get straight A's. When you get a B, we stop paying. If you don't finish your bachelor in one year, we stop paying. So you need to do your bachelor in one year. And he said, I talked to Dr. Blanco. He's going to pay rent an insurance for one year. When you get a B, he stops paying. You need to get straight A's and finish your bachelor in one year. I said, but I don't know English. He said, we don't care. I put my knees down, took 27 credits first semester, 24 se credits second semester, 17 credits summer, plus the credits I had from Romania, and finished my bachelor in one year, magna cum laude. <coughs> when the grades came and I saw all straight A's, I put my knees down and I started to cry. I said, Lord, I don't know English. This cannot be my grades. These are yours. <laughs> Finished in one year. And I said, Lord, it's yours. You do what you want. Finish praying. I got a call from Andrews. We want you to come to Andrews. I said, I don't know. I cannot. I don't have an apartment. I don't have money for tuition. I get a phone call. Dr. Blanco says, we are impressed. You finished in one year. I'm going to pay one year in Andrews. Straight days, one year. Ed Wright calls. I'm going to pay one year tuition. So we got... Rent and tuition, one year. Went to Andrews, finished in one year. Praise the Lord, you know. And I could go on and on. Never apply for a green card. I got a letter from the government five days before we finished school. We have been selected for a green card. People pay lawyers and thousands of dollars. You follow me? And wait five, six, ten years. We got a green card. We, we went there and paid 400 a fee to get the, the medical exam done and that's it. We got a green card. I never applied for any conference. I finished school, three days later, telephone from Wisconsin. We want to hire you. I said, I don't speak English. We don't speak Romanian, and we talk on the phone. Come. Okay. <laughs> Folks, listen. God may seem not to answer, but he actually answers better than you pray. It's just that you don't like it. He is working on you. And because we don't surrender, because we have our vision and our plans, we think that God, because he doesn't do what we want, he doesn't answer. But only when we accept his will and surrender, he can work. And he has a plan for everybody. If he could have a plan for me that I was crazy, I mean, I would stay at the balcony, cut the pen in two, have rice in my hand in the church, and shoot with rice in the heads of people who are sleeping during the sermon. <laughs> I was crazy. I would take grease, and put on the doorknob at all my teachers so they could not get in the class. <laughs> I could not care less. I would take the button from the ring bell at the door and put a needle there so people would get in their finger when they push the... I did all that. I would put water in the chair. When the teacher would come, he would sit in the water and then be wet. <laughs> I would go and put a rope, like a fishing, thick, clear fishing line, around the seat on the bicycle and then unscrew the wheels and then put the other end around the tree. My friends would come from the class, get on the bike and, dang, and the wheels would go and they would drop. I did all this type of crazy stuff. I never missed ideas. 
We went to the mountains. I got jelly jam. I put in every shoe in the night. In the morning, they all had jam in the shoes. <laughs> I never missed ideas. If God could turn somebody crazy, you know, he can turn anybody. Do you follow me? I, I'm not going to tell you more what I did because you get too many ideas. But <laughs> <clears throat> I said I will talk to you about the, uh, how to protect in the last time before Jesus comes against evil spirits and, and deceptions. We didn't have time. What time is it? Somebody tell me. Huh? Oh, we passed the time. I'm hungry. Danny. This is it. Now listen. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you one more story short and we finish. We went to Cuba in two years ago in October. One, we went many times in many trips, mission trips with my church, my former church. I am not there anymore. We went to Cuba. And I told my members, God never changed. God doesn't change. It, he may not seem to answer prayers. There are prayers that you pray and no answer comes. But remember two things. Number one, when he doesn't answer, if you pray honest and humble, he is working on a better answer than you can envision or expect or pray for. And number two, when you pray not for you, but for his work, for saving the people, he will always do something if you really care for others and forget self. So I told my church members when we went to Cuba, you need to, about you, to surrender and let God's will happen. And about others, you need to persist as you would pray for you and your family. We went to Cuba. We divided it in three teams. Peter, he's a doctor, took five people, went to a location where there is no Adventist church. Randy, another doctor, took a group of five, went to another location when there is no Adventist church. I took a group of five and went to a location where there is no Adventist church with the plan to start three churches in Cuba in three locations of no Adventist presence. We get donations from people, and I give everybody. You have $2,500, you have $2,500, and I have $2,500. This is money to pay the rent, to pay the ads, to pay the transportation, to pay the food, to pay the hotel, to pay everything for evangelism. I start evangelism. Randy starts evangelism. There were three hours between me and Randy, and three hours between Randy and Peter, but six hours between me and Peter. Peter goes there, starts evangelism Friday night. I did well, Randy did well. Peter, the eye doctor, started Friday night, 16 people came. And then police came. And they said, you have no approval, we will arrest you. And then they didn't arrest him because he was an American citizen, but he said, you cannot do evangelism anymore. He said, we do have approval. And he showed the papers. And they said, this is government approval, but you don't have city approval. Anyway, they took his money. He lost the money that he paid for the room, and they stopped him from doing evangelism. What would you do if you were him? You know what he did? He called me, can I come and join you? I said, no. But you know, they don't let me do evangelism here. I said, didn't we pray and decided that you go there and start a church? Yes, stay there and start a church. But it's impossible. I said, yes, from human perspective, but nothing is impossible with God. Pray. We did pray last night. I said, how long? Well, uh, we prayed. Go back and pray. He prayed. Then he called me back. Can you send me some money? I said, no. If I send you, then I cannot finish. Ask God for money. Or well, I cannot pray for money. Oh, yes, you can. You don't pray for you. You pray for evangelism. Pray for money. He called me again. We pray for money. Nothing happened. Keep praying. While they were praying, the children joined them from the families. Those 16 families joined them in prayer. And then the Cubans joined them in prayer. While they were praying, somebody comes and says, you know, you cannot do evangelism without approval if you do in a public building. But if you do in a different church, inside a church, you can. You don't need approval. He called me, I can do it if I do it in a church. I said, okay, go and find the church. He goes to the Baptist church, they say no. He goes to the Lutheran church, they say no. He goes to the Pentecostal church, they say no. He goes to the Catholic church, they... He went to every church in the town. All of them said no. He calls me, I cannot do it. I said, go back to the first church. I did. Go again. Go three times. Go ten times. Go until they get tired and they let you in. Go. 
He started again every church. They said no. He called me. I said, go again. He goes again, third time to every church. When he gets to the Baptist church, the Baptist pastor says, listen, I make a deal. My roof is broken. It's raining in the church. We have no money to fix the roof. If you pay the roof, 2,500, we let you do evangelism in our church. Peter calls me, hey, I don't have 2,500. You do. Pray. <laughs> they pray, and he finds the envelope with the money. He says, I found them. It seems the police didn't take them. I have the 2,500 as you gave me, the envelope that I gave him in the beginning. I gave everyone an envelope with 2,500. He said, I found the envelope. I said, give it to him. He gave it to the Baptist pastor. The guy took it, and they started evangelism. Now listen. The Baptist pastor came Saturday night to check him, to see what he is teaching. And he says, I like it. So he goes to his church Sunday and says to the whole church, 140 people, you need to come Sunday night and Monday night because this is something that I never heard before. So now he brings the whole Baptist church to listen to Peter. Do you understand why they closed the building and took his building? God allowed it so he would, do you follow me? Instead of 16 people, he would get 16 plus 140 plus the Baptist pastor and his family. Okay. Now, he calls me and says, okay, I gave you 2,500 to the Baptist pastor to fix the roof, but I need to pay the Bible workers, I need to pay the hotel for every night, I need to pay the food, and I need to pay the bus that transports people to evangelism and back home. And I need about 300 a day. I said, I don't have money, pray. He says, we gave it all. He said, just leave me alone. They prayed, they checked their pockets, and he finds the envelope, 2,500. He says, I found the envelope. He calls the Baptist pastor. He says, I'm so sorry. I was supposed to give you the envelope and I still have it. And the pastor says, are you crazy? I have it. I have the 2,500 in my hand. Peter says, no, I have it. The Baptist pastor says, no, I have it. How do you explain? Now they both have 2,500. <laughs> How do you explain that? He gets 300 out of the 2,500, pays the bus, pays the food, pays the hotel, and then he counts the money. Guess how much? 2,500. Next day he pays 300, 2,500. Next day he pays 300, 2,000. All week, from Friday night to next Saturday night, every night he paid 300. At the end, he still had 2,500. He called me and said, Pastor, you will not believe, I still have 2,500. I said, can you give me that envelope, please? <laughs> you can call him, Peter Blackburn. He's a doctor in Lexington. You can ask him. You can ask you, the whole team, five people, the story. It's a real story. This is not. When they finished evangelism, 16 people got baptized. They started an Adventist church in the Baptist church. When he left that Sunday morning, following week, and drove to come to meet us, and we would do a little visiting Sunday and Monday, and then we would flow, fly back to America, when he put money to put gas in the in the van and took money from the 2500 money went down as long as he used for evangelism money stayed there when he started to use for other things money started to go down when he got to havana he already had spent about 100 for sleep food and so on and gas and i took the leftover money from randy to 300 the leftover money from me to 300 and the leftover money from peter 2300 <laughs> and gave to the cuban union because their salary is about $18 a month, and hired several pastors for three years in advance with that money from Peter. Yeah. Folks, when you pray and God doesn't seem to answer, he does answer, but not always the way you pray. Okay, let's finish because I, I got to eat. But let's have a prayer before we finish. Father in heaven, you never change. You have amazing plans. Amen. But we just want answers right now. Or we want answers the way we want. Instead of learning to be humble, to be patient, to be compassionate, to allow you to work your way in your time and just learn to surrender and to trust. Help us to know you, to experience you, <clears throat> to trust you more than you trust self. Help us all learn to walk with you and depend entirely on you.
Father, I make right now. I pray and I make an appeal for everybody here and specifically for the young people. Please, touch their hearts to understand that you have a plan for them. To understand that you want to use them and you can use them in a powerful way. Help them commit themselves to you. Help them learn to pray and to wait and to trust. And to trust in you, not in self. I pray in Jesus' name and thank you. Amen.